All right, folks, welcome to the Monsters, Madness, and Magic Podcast. I'm your host, Justin, here with a quick word before we dive in. Now in this episode, I chat with Academy Award-winning makeup artist V. Neal about monster movies, breaking into the business, Beetlejuice, Charles Band, Robin Williams, The Sword and the Sorcerer, Spirits, and more. As always... Thank you for listening, and if you'd like to help the show grow, please leave us a review wherever you listen to the podcast. Anyway, without further ado, here you go. It's showtime. Greetings, boils and ghouls. This is your comrade, the Crypt Keeper here, reporting dead from the sanctuary of the strange. Tonight's macabre myth is a fright-filled feature, one overflowing with monsters, madness, and magic. (laughs) Well, I guess, V, just so we have a platform to jump off of, why don't you take us back in time to when you were a youngster? Were you a book reader? Fort Builder, Troublemaker, or all of the above? <laughs> well, I used to read books, but not so much. What, what, what were the other questions again? Fort Builder, Troublemaker. Troublemaker. Yeah. yeah. I, that one I got covered. I don't think I was all of the above, but you know, my mother called me the instigator. So I guess that means I was the troublemaker. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any siblings? I have one sister who has passed, unfortunately. Oh, sorry. But sorry. yes, I had one sister, an older sister. Now, when it comes to books and stuff, did you have a genre early on that you leaned towards, maybe a specific writer? Not so much. I think I read, you know, I was only allowed to read whatever my parents would buy me. So, it did, you know, it didn't really Nancy Drew kind of crap. You know, that was sort of my era, mm-hmm. that type of stuff. Yeah. Like this, That was the coolest stuff I could get, you know, or the Hardy Boys or some other kind of crap like that, you know, because <laughs> I was destined to be a Mouseketeer type thing, you know. So when you think back to the, you know, formative films and TV shows of your childhood, you know, what comes to mind? What pops out? Well, I used to love to watch the old Universal Horror movies. Whenever they came on, I don't care how many times I've seen them, I'd watch them again, you know? And they had this thing when I was young called the Million Dollar Movie. And every day at five o'clock, they would play a movie. And they would sometimes do a whole month of horror movies. So I would watch the same movie over and over at five o'clock every day. And I think my mother finally put a stop to it because... I was watching The Beast with Five Fingers and I got so obsessed with this movie that I was like walking around the house, like looking around all the doors and creeping (laughs) around. My mother goes, what are you doing? And I said, he might be there. And my mother goes, who? And I said, The Beast with Five Fingers. It was just this stupid crawling hand thing. It was, you know, some guy got his hand chopped off and it came back to life to look for a ring or something. Crazy stuff. So anyway, I guess I was in and I and I loved watching all those really cheesy like sci-fi movies with the horrible rubber and cardboard board monsters <laughs> you know all that kind of stuff so. <laughs> that's just about all we had when i was younger but i did love you know this island earth and you know all the you know all those kind of that genre of science fiction so you know there weren't horror movies back then like there are now thankfully right. because back then they were really scary like i remember going to the theater to see the 13 ghosts and that was like in 3d and it was like really scary you know and stuff like that which now would be considered cheesy, but that was about as spooky as it got. Or, you know, like the invasion of the body snatchers, Mm. which was still kind of sci-fi horror type stuff. I think my formative years were probably science fiction was much more prevalent than horror movies were because, you know, that was kind of the atomic era, you know? Were you a fan of the Twilight Zone? Mm. I still am. I watch mm. those old ones, you know, like on Thanksgiving Day. They have them on all day long and I'll watch them all day. I'll put them on. Oh, I remember that one. This last Thanksgiving, actually, I saw a couple that I don't think I'd ever seen. Or maybe I just didn't remember because they weren't my favorite ones or something. They weren't repeatedly played over and over like Chatner with the plane and that, you know, (laughs) all all of those. But I love it. And, oh, The Outer Limits was really good. There was some other really cool horror type. What else was there? Oh, my gosh. There was... Dark Shadows counts, I think. Yeah, Dark Shadows, that definitely counts. But I was already kind of working by then, so I kind of didn't get to see it a lot. 
but I did watch it in reruns. What else was around? There were some some sort of stuff, but there was a Saturday night guy named Seymour in LA and he played all the horror movies and he would make personal appearances. So I would get dressed up like a vampire or something and always go down to his personal appearances. <laughs> <laughs> and he was just not a very attractive man. He was really quite scary on his own. So and he would always like host horror movies like some Saturday matinee type thing somewhere. So that was always kind of fun. Do you remember your very first movie that you saw in the theaters? That's usually pretty formative. You know, I the only one I can remember that I saw when I was really young was like Mary Poppins, which doesn't really count, or The King and I, and I was really young. So they weren't horror. My parents wouldn't take me to see. That wasn't their thing. But they liked those kind of movies. So I remember seeing those movies when I was really young. I think I remember I had every song from The King and I, remember, you know, absolutely in my, ingrained in my brain. I got the records and I listened to the songs over and over. I knew all the words by heart and Mary Poppins, of course. But, you know, I was a girl and I wasn't surrounded by, you know, all the cool stuff that there is now. There was and as far as girls doing makeup, that was, you know, that was never going to happen. You know, my next door neighbor was a makeup artist and I. He always told me, ah, uh, yeah, sure, kid. You know, because I say, well, I want to do what you when I grow up. And he goes, yeah. Oh. You know, even after I got in, he was like totally baffled how I got in, you know. So he wouldn't help me. He tried to get his son to do it. His son didn't want to do it. He tried to get his other daughter. She didn't do it. And I'm thinking, dude, you got like a built-in person here who has been wanting to do it since they were a little kid. And you don't want to help me? Right. right. Whereabouts did you grow up? Was it near L.A.? or San Fernando Valley mm. in Los Angeles. Yeah. So uh, what monster scared you the most as a kid? The Mummy. Mm, good choice. Frankenstein was good, but there was something about The Mummy that just didn't set well with me. Really scared the bejesus out of me. See, because I thought, sure, that's possible. You could put a guy together and bring him to life. But a mummy? I don't know. That's creepy. When he opened that one eye and it was sparkling in there, that freaked me out. And his finger started to move. And <laughs> oh, it still freaks me out. I love The Mummy. Were your parents involved in the business at all? No. Well, come to find out after I was an adult and already in the business, my mother said, well, you know, I worked for the biggest entertainment attorney in Hollywood when you were a little girl. I said, and you never told me that. <laughs> oh, you know, she used to go over to movie stars homes and get them to sign papers all the time. I never knew that. You know, as far as I knew, she was an executive secretary at some law firm. I had no idea what who they were. This right. was like years later. And then she worked for NBC for a while and, you know, Johnny Carson and all that. But by then I was already in the business. But no, my dad was my dad was actually a rocket scientist. He was a designer engineer for Lockheed and he actually helped design the X-15. So wow. that was kind of my big thing. I was like, wow, my dad designed the X-15, yada, yada, you know. Yeah. And then later on, he actually was the guy who designed the tiles for the shuttlecraft. So that was pretty spectacular. Wow. But that's... Well, my dad was a designer engineer and a genius and a total social reject. <laughs> Carry on a conversation with anybody to save the soul, you know. <laughs> that you say your dad helped with the NASA shuttles. My wife's grandfather, uh, he helped patent the material that they put on the shuttles to help them go through orbit. So maybe they worked together. They must have worked together. <laughs> they yeah. must have. That's crazy. They must have. That's really cool. Were you ever interested in drama or theater growing up? Did you ever dip your toe in there? Oh, well, you know, when I was going to high school, I was always involved with all the school plays and everything. And mm. I would always either be building the costumes or working in the hair and makeup department for the movies or whatever, if I was interested. If I didn't think the makeup and hair was interesting enough, I would make costumes. I didn't care. I liked doing it all. Didn't go to college, so. <laughs> when did you first, do you remember your first time you tinkered on your own? Maybe like you made a gorilla mask or something when you were eight or something. I don't know. The first I, time you just started playing around. You know, I never, I never did stuff like that. And I kind of was like not, the most advanced I ever got as a child was I had cousins that I went to go visit. And there were five girls. And every time we go over there, it was a holiday. And they used to like, I would go over there and they were like, they were all going, oh God, here she comes. <laughs> it was like, because I would always make them get dressed up. And I would put makeup on them. And we'd make costumes out of crepe paper if that's all we had. You know, but for Thanksgiving, I'd dress them up as pilgrims and Indians and turkeys and made everybody get all done up and put on little plays. And so that was my claim to fame as a child, very young adulthood. But other than that, not so much. And I see, the thing was, you have to remember, I was always told that I couldn't do that for a living, that women didn't do makeup. And so I just kind of thought, okay, well, I'm not going to worry about it then. I'll just figure out something else to do, you know. My mother used to always ask me what I wanted to do. And I said, well, I either want to be a makeup artist or an archaeologist. 
So she said, well, you know, you have to go to school a long time to be an archaeologist. And she says, I hope you can find money somewhere because you won't be able to do anything without it. And I went I was like, well, I can't do makeup because I don't know anybody and I'm not a guy. And I can't be an archaeologist because I'm going to have to find some rich person to help fund my digs and stuff. And I'm going, I'm like doomed. I don't want to do any of this other stuff. You know? <laughs> so <laughs> I kind of gave up hope. And then when I got out of high school, my mother was going to send me to Loyola University. And I said, you know what, mom? I said, let's just, uh, I always say my mom, my dad was involved too, but like he, he like I said, he didn't talk much. I, it was like, I, I said, you know, you're going to spend all that money and I'm not really sure I'm going to learn the things that I want to know, you know? So she, I said, why don't we do this? I said, I tell you what, I said, maybe I can be a costume designer because I like making costumes. She goes, okay. She goes, so what do you want to do? I said, well, there's a little fashion merchandising school here. It's not going to cost a whole lot of money. I can get my feet wet and see if that's something I'm interested in and blah, blah, blah. So I went there and it was like a 12 month course. And I thought, well, if I really like it, I can go to FIT or something, you know, Fashion Institute, sorry. And I got there and I was there for a year and I realized these people are nuttier than a fruitcake. <laughs> and, you know, they're all backstabbers. And I said, I don't think I can really do that thing you know I, I can't do that and by then I was kind of already making costumes for friends of mine and all kinds of stuff and I had these friends these gay friends of mine who owned a vintage clothing store and we used to always go on the weekends and do the flea markets back then and back then you could get the coolest vintage clothing because it was the 70s so there was still a lot of clothes from the 40s floating around and you could get them by going to all these we knew where to go you know downtown LA you could unbundle these bundles of clothes and we'd find these amazing 40s gowns with you know certain sequins all over them and shit and just you know <laughs> make a fortune on them fur coats everything in these bundles of old rags supposedly rags right so I opened a vintage clothing store I was 18 years old and in the interim of all that, I wound up getting married to, well, I went out with it. I got to start over here. I, I Let me back up a little bit. Back it up. So, uh, I started hanging out with a lot of rock bands and stuff because I would get, get them clothes. And then I started making clothes for this little band in, in L.A. called Zolar X who wanted these space suits. And I was going out with the drummer who was, he was a drummer when I met him. And then he became the lead singer. So the band said, you know, this is really cool. We really like these clothes and stuff and our haircuts and, and I was dying their hair colors and they said, but we really want to have big pointed ears and po big heads and pointed ears. And I went, yes. I said, okay. I said, this is what I really want to do. I'm going to go find out how to do it, right? So I started going down to the Star Trek conventions in San Diego. Back then, there was Comic-Con, but it was just comic books. But so I went to these Star Trek conventions, and I started meeting people. I met Fred Phillips, who was the original, um, who did Star Trek, the original TV show. I met a couple of other guys, some writers and stuff. And one time I was there, and I saw these five guys dressed up in Planet of the Apes outfits. And I mean, full-on, perfect costumes, full-on makeups, hair, the whole thing. And I went up to him, and I said, hey, you guys, where'd you get those masks? And they looked at me and they go, they're not masks, they're makeups. And I said, even better, where'd you get them? <laughs> and they said, we made them. And I said, hey, I said, can you teach me how to do that stuff? And they looked at each other and they said, yeah, but you're a girl. And I said, I know, isn't it fabulous? <laughs> <laughs> And so the one guy kind of took a shine to me and goes, okay. He says, well, you know, we live in Santa Barbara. If you want, you can come up and hang out with us on the weekends in our garage where we make our stuff. And I said, okay. I had a car, so fine. I just would take off and go up to Santa Barbara and watch him make stuff and sculpt and make molds and all this kind of stuff. And I said, okay, I can do this, right? I, I can do this. And so I kind of all of a sudden fell in love with one of the guys and, you know, <laughs> that thing happens. And his name was Steve Neal, and we're still friends to this day. Oh, wow. And that's where my last name comes from as well. So we started <laughs> working as like a team. And instead of just saying we were boyfriend, girlfriend, we just said we were married. So I took his last name. And I liked his last name better was my first name, V, that I was going by then. So I thought, well, V Neal sounds a lot better than what I was using. So I'm just going to use that name. And... We were together about three and a half years and he taught me everything he knew. It and turns out he didn't really like being on set because he was kind of more of a recluse. He liked to sculpt and be tinkering with all of his stuff all the time. So I went on set and he stayed at home, made stuff and that's how it began. And finally I got into the union. They, they had to open up the unions in the mid seventies because they didn't have enough people in it. The government made them open the union up and I got in and he said, I don't want to be in the union. I said, are you sure? And he goes, yeah, he says, I, it's not really what I want to do. And I said, okay. So I got in and he didn't. And the rest is history. <laughs> wow. How did you land the first job? What was it? I know that you worked on, uh, 
I think it was uh, Fred Phillips that helped you get on Star Trek, but I don't believe that was your first job. No, my first job was with Steve. We did a little horror movie called Tourist Trap. We did another kind of crazy little movie called Laser Blast. (laughs) We did a bunch of movies for Charlie Band. I did a couple for Larry Cohen. But, you know, a lot of people were with um, Roger Corman. I don't know why I couldn't think of his name, but I never worked for Roger. I worked for Charlie Band, so I did a lot of his films. And one, and then I did a film called Kingdom of the Spiders with Bill Shatner, right? Well, when at one of those Star Trek conventions, I had met Fred, and we, we became friends, and Steve and Fred and I were all friends. And we would get jobs where we couldn't go on union sets, so we'd call up Fred and say, Hey, Fred, we got this job. We made this thing. Can you go put it on for us? And he'd say, Sure, kids. And so he would we'd give him the stuff, and he'd go apply it, you know? And then cut to Fred. Now I'm in the union. I got in the union, still friends with Fred and everything. And one day Fred calls me up and I'll I'll never forget this day. I was standing in my dining room and we had this little cubby hole where the phone was. And I almost ripped the doors off the wall when he asked me. But I said, he said, hey, V, he says, you worked with Bill Shatner before. And I said, yeah, I did that spider movie with him. He goes, okay, he says, good. He says, well, they're going to do a Star Trek movie. Do you think you'd want to work on that with me? And I went, what? (laughs) Like lost my mind. (laughs) I like almost ripped the door off this little, it was like a little louver door on this thing. I was holding on to it and I almost <laughs> lost my change there. And I said, hell yeah, I want to work on it with you. He actually had Steve on it as well. Steve sculpted a lot of this stuff. He helped with the Klingons. And there was a whole bunch of people that I still know to this day. We all worked on He got all these young up and coming artists to come work with him on Star Trek to build this stuff. And the boys weren't in the union that they couldn't put it on, but I was. And Fred's daughter was in the union by then as well, Jana. So it was Jana and myself, and there was a bunch of other makeup artists, but Jana and I were the ones that were with him all the time. And Charlie Schramm was there. Charlie was working in the lab. and But Jana and I were his second. So here he was with these two young girls, and he's got the whole original cast. And then we also have Stephen Collins, who was like the new hot shot on the bridge and all this. And so I did Bill's makeup. I did the guy with the big forehead. I did his makeup. And then I would watch Leonard on the set for him because Fred's eyes were starting to go. He had a a floating blood vessel that was kind of messing up his dimensional eyesight. So he had me watch Leonard on the set. So I would watch Leonard, make sure. And he'd make me stay behind in the makeup room to make sure that he got Leonard's eyebrows on straight and there was no glitches in his ears and stuff. And, you know, whoever, I I think I, I did check off once in a while. I did, you know, you know, we split up the rest of the cast. But um, Jana was doing Persis, who had the bald head, and she was like a big makeup job because we really had relatively light skin, but she had really black hair. So it was a big deal to cover up her head. It was like a whole ordeal every day covering her head up to make her look perfect, you know? So she was kind of a big makeup job. So we split the whole cast up, basically, the three of us. First big union movie. Let's put it that way. Ah, That was the first big union movie. I talked to a lot of people, V, and most people have an origin either with Corman or with Charles Band. It seems that way, you know. And yeah. The people that I talk to, I love Charles Band, and most of them do love him, but, you know, some people don't. I just want to know <laughs> what you know, your experience I like with Charlie, Charlie was. And, and I never had a problem with Charlie, and I always got paid. Yeah. Some people didn't always get paid with Charlie. And I remember one time I did something for him, and I went in to get my check, and he says, I can't give it to you for a couple of weeks. And I said, Really? I said, okay. I said, Charlie, you've always made good by me. You've always paid me. And I said, all right, I'll wait for a couple of weeks. But if you don't pay me, I'll be back here. So on my way out the stage, I said, well, I'm just going to take this director's chair with me just in case I don't get paid. <laughs> so I, t- I walked out of the thing with the director's thing and I threw it in the back of my Fiat and drove off. <laughs> I kept the chair anyway. <laughs> Have you seen him recently at all? I did. I ran into him at Monster Palooza a couple of years ago. It's weird. He, I think he had a stroke, but he's not too messed up. But he still looks, still looks like Charlie. He still looks. He's all baby face, but he's like an older baby face. <laughs> yeah. It's really freaky looking. <laughs> I don't know what you mean. <laughs> yeah, he still looks like a little kid and like a little man in an old man's body, you know. And he still has his like, wow, youthful spirit. Right. Yeah, he did. I don't know if he's still... Is he still alive? Yeah, yeah, he's alive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He just released a biography. There was another director that I worked with that I really liked who's not alive anymore, though. I did a film called Radioactive Dreams with him. He was a Filipino director. He was really cool. Pugh, I think his last name was... What was his name? Are you talking about Albert Albert Pugh? Albert Albert Pugh. Yeah, I was going to ask you about him because you worked on Sword and Sorcerer. Yes, that too. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. He just passed recently. Mm-hmm. I liked Albert. And uh, that was a non-union picture for me, Sword and the Sorcerer. Gotcha. What, what specifically did you work on on that? 
I was a department head. Gotcha. Was that your first time as a head? No, I was always the department head. Oh, wow. So you started Except out. Except for like on, uh, when I was non-union, I was always a department head. It was only when I first got in the union that I wasn't a department head right away because I didn't really know anybody yet and I couldn't, you know, started getting jobs where I was the head. And I think it was a lot of the times I was the head because there was like special makeup or something and not that many people did it back then. So they needed people that could do it. So that's why I got hired a lot of the times. Do you have free creative reign over something when you start on it? Do you have an idea of where they want you to go? And do they kind of pinpoint you where to go after you start? How does that work? Well, the kind of pictures that I work on, I've always worked in conjunction with the big studio lab. Like I'd always work with Rick Baker or Greg Canham or Stan Winston or the Bermans or something. They always get hired first, so they do all the design work. So when I come in, what's left to me is to actually bring the character to life. I have to apply it and paint it. Sometimes they give you, you know, they'll give you the basic paint scheme. They'll pre-paint stuff, but it's up to you to finish it off and make it look realistic and all that stuff. So a lot of times I can put my spin on it and I can alter stuff, paint jobs or whatever, as long as it's what the director wants. I mean, basically, my job was to give the director exactly what he wanted. A lot of times, stuff is pre-designed. Sometimes it wasn't, and it, it, it just depended, you know, on how, how much control they, there was in the lab ahead of time, you know? Sometimes they just give you stuff and say, go, you know? How, what do you remember specifically for the vampire design for the Lost Boys? Was that something? That, that, that I was involved in with Greg, because Joel Schumacher was my friend, and I got Greg that job. So I had already done two pictures with Joel at that point. And Joel says, well, we want Steve Johnson to do the vampires. And I said, no, 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 not Steve. I said, I love Steve, but not him. It's going to be a monster. They're going to be monsters because he makes scary looking monsters. He had already done Fright Night. I said, if you do that, he's gonna, they're going to come out scary looking. And I said, I think these guys need to be like scary dark angels. Mm. They need to be so beautiful and so scary, but not creepy scary. Like they have to be like dark angel scary. And so Joel said, I, I like that. Okay. So I said, please have my Greg, my friend Greg do it and he'll do it like really nice. We'll talk about it and we'll, they'll be beautiful, you know? So that's kind of where that whole thing came from. Greg and I did a test and at the same time, Steve Johnson did a test and Joel says, okay, I get it now. <laughs> so <laughs> That's kind of how that happened. In fact, our test was a lot scarier than the way they came out. It was a little bit more elaborate. The pieces were a lot bigger on the forehead. And we did ours on Brooke. And we took it way back. And I said, you know what? It looks too creepy. You know, they we want them to be able to use their hair. We don't want to use wigs and stuff. And he goes, yeah, we don't want to use wigs. So that's what we did. We lowered it down, just made them the brow pieces. Kiefer had the biggest one because Kiefer had the, you know, the butch haircut and it was like worked better with his look, but all the other guys had hair down. So it was kind of pointless to put it just it. We wanted to really concentrate on their eyes and make them scary and beautiful and have the cool double teeth and. And did a great job on that. That's obviously that's a classic vampire movie. So correct me if I'm wrong, but you won your first Academy Award on Beetlejuice, right? Correct. Uh huh. So when you look back and reflect on the time on Beetlejuice, is there is there any indicators in the moment that you were working on something special? No. It was a really low budget picture. And, you know, by then I think he had only really done P the Pee Wee movie and nobody really knew what it was gonna come out. We knew this was gonna be a comedy, but I was thinking, Oh god, nobody's gonna see this. It's kinda <laughs> hokey but fun, you know. Now that we did get to that I did get to design. Because really? all the only picture that that the only idea that we ever saw from Tim was I got a sketch of a guy who looked like a derelict in a in a big trench coat, you know. And I said, "Oh, <laughs> he's gonna look like a bum." He goes, "Well, kind of." And so I I did I did a test makeup with him the way he looked with the trench coat and the dark eyes and kind of dirty and stuff. And I put some I I thought well it'd be cool to put some moss on him so he looks kind of you know, like cruddy and stuff, but. He just looked nasty and like a derelict. And I altered that a couple of times and I said to Tim, I said, okay, Tim, enough. I said, can I just take him back to the trailer and do what I want to do on him? Because I knew that he had to kind of resemble the other guys that we designed or that I designed for the rest of the show, not the three dimensional part, but the paint jobs. Cause I had to design all the paint jobs for everything. And once I saw what the lighting was going to be like on the set, we kind of had to change our idea a little bit because originally we wanted to make them all pastel colored. Because when I was talking to Tim, I said, he says, I want them to be all pastel colored. And I said, oh, like Necco wafers. <laughs> and he said, yeah, like Necco wafers. And I said, maybe a little bit more color than that. And he goes, yeah, but that's the idea. And I went, okay. 
So we kind of kept Beetlejuice in the NECA wafer zone because he was actually a very pale yellow. But he it was so pale that it always kind of reflected almost white. But if you think about it, white always shows blue. He never looked blue. He was just always kind of white, you mm-hmm. know. But it was it was like an off kind of a sick yellowy kind of white. And his hair was like a bizarre color too because we started with a platinum wig. And Yolanda dyed that wig about five times before we got the color. It was kind of dirty beige, like it was filthy dirty. It was pale yellow and green tips. And it was like, it was all over the place, you know? And it was just nasty when it was done. And we said, that's perfect. (laughs) (laughs) So the whole idea was that he like had crawled up from uh, underneath a rock. And that's why he was so pale like that. And, you know, he had the moss growing up from underneath his (laughs) clothes and his hair and everything. Michael said, you know, I don't want... He says, I don't want my nose. Can we give me a broken nose? And I said to Steve, I said, Steve, we don't have any money. I said, do you have any like stock broken noses or anything? And because this is Steve Laporte who worked with me on the film. He goes, no, but I have two swollen lips we can use. (laughs) So he, we got, we put one on one side of his nose and one on the other side of his nose to give him a broken nose. That's how he had it. That's how he got his broken nose. So we, Steve just ran a bunch of swollen lips the whole time. And Steve made his teeth for him because, you know, we had no money. The only way the movie got made, like they used the prop builder, Bob Short, to make all the prosthetics for the background people. So we actually had a prop maker build in all the prosthetics. <laughs> he did hire some makeup guys who sculpted prosthetics, you know, to do it, work in his shop. But he was initially the prop builder. He, the reason he got the job was he said, I'll give you a really good price if you let me do everything. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how he got the job. That's my short Beetlejuice story. How much time uh, was the application on Michael for Beetlejuice? Oh, he was about an hour and a half. That's not bad. No, he was pretty quick, but we had to make a bald cap and put it on him every day. So I guess probably it was about two hours by the time he got his wig on and stuff. Because we had gotcha. to go back and forth a little bit. Like after he get his wig on, I'd have to do a little touch up around the edges with the moss and whatever else kind of crud we were putting on him. And we had to do his hands, too. Oh, and you know, a funny story is like he only worked two weeks on the movie, maybe two and a half weeks. Wow. If you think about it, we did all of his stuff at once. He was always on the little, he was always in the, the model, except for the two scenes that you see him with the other live people. So those were only a couple of days of shooting. But the rest of the time, he was always in the model. So he was always by himself. But anyway, so I said, Michael, I said, we want to put fake nails on you. And he goes, really? And I said, well, I could glue nails on you every day. He goes, oh. I said, so I tell you what, will you just be willing to wear some cruddy nails for a couple of weeks? And he says, okay. So I had my acrylic lady come in, little, you know, Asian lady come in and sit and put these acrylic nails on him. And I said, I said, now don't make them look nice. And she goes, what? What do you mean don't make them look nice? I said, I want you to put ridges in them and make them all chunky on the ends, like broken and like he has rotten fingernails. She goes, really? I said, yeah. Can you do it? And she started doing it. I said, no, like this. I took the tool away from my stars. I said, like that. She goes, oh, my God. And I said, yeah, just like that. Make them really bad. <laughs> it's against her nature. So he wore them around for two because it was easier. And it, think about it, you guys have to zip your pants up and shit. It's a pain in the ass. <laughs> so he didn't have to worry about losing his fingernails. <laughs> That's hilarious. He was pretty good about it. I did that to the boys on Lost Boys, too. Put acrylics on them? Yeah, they had acrylics on. So they had those razor blade knives the whole movie. Hair extensions, which hadn't really been done yet on anybody except for like pop stars and, you know, stuff like that. We're the only ones that even knew about hair extensions. Now, I won't ask you to name names, obviously, but, you know, as a makeup artist, you spend a lot of time in the chair with folks. Has anybody ever been, you know, a little cranky? Well, there was a couple of cranky ones. There was one that was just an asshole, but I'm, I mean... Uh, not a nice person, but um, I actually worked with a cranky one recently again, and he's actually not so cranky anymore now that he's older. And he was really happy to see me. I hadn't seen him in 20 years, and he was ecstatic to see me. I couldn't believe it because after I worked with, I did two movies in a row with him, and after I worked with him, I said I can't do this anymore. He was fine. With, he loved me, but he was he was mean spirited, and he just <laughs> loved tormenting people. You know, he got the little wardrobe girl to cry in one movie, and he was oh, laughing. No. And he thought it was the best thing ever. Oh man! <laughs> this is after she threw his clothes down in the dirt and the mud and the snow, and he thought that was the greatest thing. He got her to cry, and I thought, "What a mean turd!" <laughs> <laughs> Damn, dude! <laughs> How far apart did you guys work together? Was it like twenty years, fifteen? Well, two those two movies were back to back. Oh, okay. The two movies that I did with him were back to back, and then the last one I did was twenty years apart. Gotcha. Okay. <laughs> but he kept asking me for for me after that movie, and I finally handed him off to. Uh, 
Monty Westmore because I figured Monty is the only person that he's going to respect because Mon- he really respected Monty. The thing was, if you stood up for yourself and you could prove that you were, you know, worthy, he was good to you. He would stand up for you. He would do anything for you. But the minute you cowered or didn't stand up for yourself, he just started working on you. <laughs> <laughs> like to mess with you. <laughs> I remember I was on the first movie I did with him. He walked into the trailer one morning and, and John Blake, who was working on the film with me, he says, Good morning, so and so. He says, "How you doing today?" And he looked at John and he goes, "F you, John." <laughs> you know, but he said the whole word. <laughs> and without a beat, he sat down and John said, "That must mean you're feeling pretty good, de- pretty goddamn good today." <laughs> he started laughing. He thought it was the funniest thing because John stood up for himself. He didn't let him, you know, mess yeah. with him or hurt his feelings. He just said, "Oh, that's great." He started <laughs> laughing. I remember I said to John, I said, after that, I said, John, like about a week and a half into the movie, I said, I said, is this guy ever going to start having fun on this movie? Or is he just going to be a miserable turd the whole time? And he goes, he says, you don't get it, V. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, he's having fun right now. <laughs> I went, oh, shit. <laughs> I thought, oh, too mean spirited for me. I can't. I, you know, like I said, he didn't mess with me, but I couldn't stand watching him do it to everybody else. So <laughs> I, I declined the several times I was asked thereafter. Probably for the best. Me anyway. <laughs> yeah. On a Dick Tracy V, were you the? Were you also the head on that one? No, I was not the head on Dick Tracy. I was hired by John Caglione and Doug Dresker on that film, but I did do Al Pacino's makeup for that. So that was fun. I really liked working with Al. You know, they had a lot of R&D on that film ahead of time. So they pretty much knew what everybody was going to look like. They didn't really know what Big Boy was going to look like. So they pretty much sat me in a room with Al and they said, V, just start trying stuff on him till you figure out what Big Boy is going to look like. Because they had so many stock prosthetics, right? So he says, you and Al figure it out what you think big boy should look like so i would just try different noses on we try chin we put cheeks we do noses or chins or whatever until finally we got a combination that we liked and when we found what we pretty much liked we showed johnny says okay i'll go sculpt these now for him so that's how we got the dick tracy look for al pacino i'll just ask if you were the head on that one because that seemed like it'd be a monumental task with all the oh, that was that was yeah. a huge film they no they did a great job oh, and i've no. worked with john since then too because I hired him on Amazing Spider-Man because I couldn't be on the whole, the second one because I couldn't be on the whole film. Mm. So he took over the film after I left. And we were shooting in New York, so it was much easier for him. It would be remiss of me not to ask about Mrs. Doubtfire and working with Robin Williams. He was a dream, an absolute dream. He was so much fun. I took the the cupboards off the... Um, uh, the doors off the cupboards behind me and i put a monitor up there and we'd play movies for him every day so he would just sit there do his makeup is that the longest makeup project that you've worked on maybe from start to finish mm, no i've worked on longer films but that i did that makeup like 54 times i think on him and when we started it was about 40 it took about it, well the first real test makeup day that we did was about four hours and then I eventually got it down to two hours plus his hair and wardrobe. Just like the question I asked you earlier, people being cranky. You now, with someone like Robin, is it pretty much the opposite? Do you have to calm him down or tell him to stop? You That's know, why he watched movies every day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And lucky for us, um, <laughs> Stefan Dupuis was my assistant on that film. And lucky for me, Stefan just happened to have a second laser disc player at his house he wasn't using because the laser discs were big back then. And he had a whole bunch of cool laser discs. So he would bring in a different movie every day and we'd sit Robin down and Robin would start. To, and Robin, funny enough, had not hardly seen any films. I like, I mean, like classic films either. Like he had never seen. Oh, geez, Citizen Kane. Wow. I couldn't believe he had never seen Citizen Kane. So we had him watch Citizen Kane. I mean, you name it. And he saw a lot of movies because we did that makeup over 50 times. <laughs> so he got a real education, <laughs> film education on that on that movie. And pretty soon we'd start asking him, okay, what would you like to see that you never saw? So we'd go out and rent different laser discs and stuff. And we'd have a whole lineup for the week. And it was pretty cool. So V, you started your own makeup school in 2021. What was your catalyst for that move? Well, I had been working at another school. You know, when they initially hired me, they said, well, we want you to help us update our syllabus and our kits and everything and blah, blah, blah. And I thought, cool, I can help turn this school. And it was like pretty much the biggest school around at the time. And I thought, well, cool, I can help them really make this like the Harvard of makeup schools, right? Well, come to find out they didn't want to change anything. They were cheap and 
didn't want to change things. They already had a whole, they had all this really crappy makeup and supplies and stuff that they put in their kits for the students. I'm thinking they can't learn with this stuff. This is antiquated, not makeup. It's just terrible. It was terrible, cheap makeup. I said, these brushes aren't even as good as brushes you can buy at the dollar store, guys. I mean, they, how can you teach somebody how to do stuff if they don't have the right tools? Can we, and at that time I had my, I also had my own line of brushes. So they could have used my, they could have put my brushes in there. I would have given them a great deal. They didn't want to do that. Well, we got to get rid of these other ones first. I said, why don't you just have a big sale and get rid of all that crap? You know, and let's make good makeup kits for these kids to learn how to do stuff. You get, they have to have the right equipment and the right makeup to do stuff in your, you can't teach them the new techniques with all this old makeup. They didn't want to do that. Then I said, okay, well, let's start working on the syllabus. If I can't change that, let's start working on the syllabus. I'd want to change things. Well, you can't do that because we don't have teachers that can teach them that. And I went, then I, I, I just, at one point I thought, just shut up V, just take the paycheck and, you know, go in and say hello once in a while and leave. And I thought, okay, well, you can't fight City Hall. <laughs> I thought, that's a shame. They're just wasting it, you know? And then COVID hit and they weren't letting me leave. And I finally said, you guys, I'm not coming in anymore. I said, you, we're, we're right down in the heart of Koreatown. I said, there's too many transients. There's too many people coming and going from here. I don't know where these kids go at night. I said, I can't stay here. I don't want to get sick, you know, because if I get sick, something might happen to me and I ain't going to happen. So I went home and shortly, finally, they had to close the school because the city came in and closed them down. And then um, the guy who like pretty much built the whole school up for the owner, he called me one day and he said, V, he says, I got fired. And I said, what? He built the school up from 25 students to like hundreds, right? Every, every, every year. And I said, you didn't even, the owner didn't even call you? No, they sent me an email. And I said, you've got to be kidding me. Wow. And this is after he was there for 25 years. And he was the only one that could really run that school and knew what to do. And they were starting to give him a hard time about stuff that he wanted to do. And I just said, that sucks. And one day we were sitting around in my living room and I said, damn it. I said, we should just start our own school and make it good. <laughs> and he goes, nah. he says, I can't do that. B. He says, I don't have enough money for that. And I go, yeah, I guess I really don't have enough money for that either. Because it would cost a lot, you know. So we kind of just thought, oh, well, whatever. It was a nice thought. And then another friend of mine was over who's I'm also partners in business with. And we're all sitting around and we were talking. He said, what happened at blah, blah, blah. And Lee told him and um, he goes, you guys should start your own makeup school. And Lee says, I can't. I don't have any money. And I said, yeah, I don't really have the money either. And <laughs> my friend looks at me, and goes, I do. And I went, <laughs> OK, you're on. <laughs> I said, I can get money. <laughs> and we made it happen. When did you guys have your first class? last year and right now we're wait we're bu still building our building it's been forever because of the the state california doesn't really want you to have a business here evidently you know but we just finally got our electrical panel in and of course that's a whole other thing with the electric company trying to get them out there to uh, it's like <laughs> you know, it's like if it's not one thing it's the other right because we needed a 600 amp thing for the building which was huge and we couldn't get it it was going to take a year to get one and we just happened to luck out and find one someplace in the midwest somewhere that and it was like a fluke and i thought you know they wait much longer i'm not doing it because i'm going to be ancient and i don't want to be standing up when i'm 80 years old you know right so we finally got that now we're dealing with that and our contractor's ill so now we have to wait for him to get better it's like okay fine but in the meantime, we've been running the classes at Friends Beauty Supply upstairs in their educational lot. So thank God we've had, which is, it's actually been really good because once the school starts, I won't be able to teach all the classes. But right now I'm teaching all the classes. So if somebody wants to get a class and have me as their teacher, it's gold because I have the educational loft up there. It's great because they pretty much get one-on-one -on -one with me because the most students we can really handle up there is a dozen at a time. Right. And I can't really get around to all of them without an assistant. It's pretty bitching and I'm having a great time. And it's good because I can see, for me, it's really good because I wrote the syllabus. It l allows me to see how much can be taught and how many people can be in the class at once and learn quickly enough, you know, because you don't really know until you run a class to see how people are going to, how the, how you can pace the classes. Right. And right now I've had people that are already makeup artists that just want to learn to do better at what they do. So that's been really cool. I've had union makeup artists from the East Coast come out to take my classes because they said, we're starting a period piece next week and we have to age some people. So we thought, who better to learn from? Right. So they came out and they took age classes. They took hair laying classes. We're doing ventilating classes now, which means you can make hair pieces. It's really cool that we're getting to see how these classes run and make sure that everybody can keep up. And so right now, everybody that I've had at the classes, most of them are already working makeup artists that just want to get better 
or they want to learn how to do things that they've never been able to do before or didn't know how to do. So it's really cool because and I get to teach them personally, basically, because I can go around with every student, work with every student right now. Right. You know, if Steven Spielberg were doing a directing class, it'd be foolish not to take advantage of it. Why not learn from one of the best, you know? That's right. If he, yeah, I'd go take that. Yeah. Hell, yeah. <laughs> I'd go <laughs> with him. <laughs> v, I wanted to ask, I want to just back up just for a second. Uh, you've been told your whole life, women can't, you can't do this because you're a woman, you know? Yeah. But then we fast forward to Beetlejuice and you, you get the news that you're getting nominated for an Oscar for doing this. What's going on internally? I was freaking out. <laughs> well, number one, I thought we're never going to win. We're up against Rick Baker for coming to America. How are we ever going to win? How is that crummy little comic book type makeup job I did on Beetlejuice going <laughs> to win again? You know, Eddie Murphy <laughs> coming to America, you know? But if you think about it, I think the the movie was so unique in, its, in what it was, you know? And Rick Baker had won the Oscar every freaking year <laughs> up until then. And I think... I think we just lucked out. I think the Academy got tired of giving it to him every year because he's so good. It's like, yeah, we know you're great, Rick. Let somebody else win one for a change. I don't know. But we also were in there with the Bermans for um, Scrooged, which was fabulous, too. And there was amazing makeup. So I, I think because it was such a quirky, funny, crazy movie that they thought it was really refreshing. And they and we won. I could not believe it. I was freaking out. You know, and the most fun thing about you know, being nominated for an Oscar is they have they have the um, nominees luncheon. Mm -hmm. And when you go to the luncheon, all the nominees are there. So everybody's in the same boat. You're there with the directors, the actors, the sound people, the visual effect. You're there with everybody. Everybody that's nominated is at this. And you, they put you at tables and you're all mixed up. So you don't know who you're going to sit with. You could be sitting next to Tom Cruise <laughs> one year. You could be sitting next to Steven Spielberg. One, you know, right. You don't know who you're going to be sitting with at your table. And they mix it all up. There's one of everything at a table pretty much, you know, or different groups like that. And they say, okay, now when you get up there, when they call your name, don't saunter up like you're trying to be cool. They said, you just won an Academy Award. Run up there and get the damn thing. You know, it's like, get going. We want you to see how excited you are. You know, and when once you get up there, there's going to be a big screen that's going to start flashing the time of like how much time you have left to talk so it's going to start with 45 seconds and then count starts counting down so you know when you have to get off because they said the music's going to start and they're going to play you off the stage basically <laughs> so we thought okay groovy so we got up there and each one of us had our little 15 second part of the speech so all three of us could talk you know and we did it and we get shuffled off stage and we're in the elevator because i can't remember where what venue we were at that year but we were in an elevator going to another floor to get talk to press and everything and i remember jumping up and down holding on to steve's lapels like this <laughs> and i had an oscar in one hand and I'm like, i stopped from it i said steve did you see the screen they were talking about he goes i didn't see anything v and i said i didn't see anything either all i saw was white light it was like the highest you'll ever be in your entire life that all you see is a bright white light so you don't see anything you're so elated that's what it was for me and same for steve that's awesome so that's what it was like winning an oscar <laughs> <laughs> So V, out of all the projects you've worked on in your career, you know, whether it's TV, film, whatever, which one was the most challenging? You know, is there one you lost sleep over? Ooh, I don't know that I lost sleep. Well, you know what? You always lose sleep the first day because mm. you're always excited. You're not no sure how everything's going to go and stuff. But I don't know that I ever lost sleep over anything. I don't think. I mean, sometimes when you have a lot going on, you can't shut down. You might be thinking about stuff but i don't think anything ever was like that i i i was always pretty well prepared and if i wasn't i faked my way through it if it was out of my control i just had to do what i could do to make it work you know <laughs> right. but i'm not sure i ever lost sleep over anything that's good because you know what we had the best job in the whole dang world you know it's like how could it be bad you know what's to lose sleep over Right. You might not have, you know, an extra, you know, body sponge or something that you need to put on a tan with or something. I don't know, <laughs> you know. <laughs> That's a good way to look at it. <laughs> What's the worst that can happen? It doesn't come out right. You take it off and start over. Exactly. Right. So this is something I like to ask everybody, V, because you never know what they're going to say. Oh, dear. <laughs> have you ever had an experience you would consider supernatural or paranormal? Ooh, not that I'd talk about. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do have a built-in ghost, though, that goes with me to all my houses. He's been with me from the beginning, so that's kind of cool. His name is Ramon. Ramon. Yeah, he is a... He looks 
like a Spaniard. He's kind of dressed like a Native American, but he looks like a Spaniard. And because of the fact that I live in the San Fernando Valley, where there was a lot of Spanish influence with the conquistadors and the natives and everything, and the Spaniards going up and down the coast, putting in all the, the missions and stuff, that's the be- That's my it's the only thing I can think of is he was he's a relic from that era. But he's still here, supposedly. I had I have a friend, a friend that is a true psychic. The first time he popped his head up, I was gone on location in Hawaii, and my girlfriend was staying with me at my house. And she called me in the middle of the night, woke me up, and I said, what is wrong? She goes, oh, my God, V. She goes, I can't stay with you anymore. And I said, why? And she goes, you, you, there's a ghost in your house, and it's freaking me out, and I have to leave. And I went, a ghost? And she goes, oh, yeah, there's something here. She says, I just called, I just called um, Andre, and he's coming over to pick me up. So cut to Andre says, oh, yes, you do have a ghost. But she she said, he's here to take care of you. He's not going to hurt you or anything. And I said, you mean that guy that I keep thinking I'm seeing is really a guy, is really a ghost? And he goes, yep. Wow. He said, his name is Ramon. And I went, get out. (laughs) I said, okay. So he says, just have a talk with him and tell him not to scare you or anything. Because when we first moved in, my girlfriend Jessica and I, we'd have weird shit disappear in the house. Like we'd have a pot disappear or a spatula or stuff would go from room to room. And I go, did you leave that in that room? I said, no, I didn't put it there. And so this one particular night that freaked her out, she got up to use the bathroom and she used to keep a candle by her bed in a, like a glass votive candle. And she went back to bed and the candle wasn't there. And she thought, oh, did I take it with me to the bathroom? So she went back into the bathroom, wasn't in the bathroom. She goes, she was walking past my bedroom. And she looked over at my bed and it was sitting next to my bed. She said, that's it, I'm out. <laughs> That's when she called me and said, I'm leaving. And I went, okay. She goes, there's definitely something here. I'm leaving. I can't. It's freaking me out. So, yes. Thank you, Ramon. But he's been cool. He hasn't ever. I, I had a, When I came back from Hawaii, I opened up a bottle of wine, and I just started walking around the house and said, dude, it's okay if you're here, but quit scaring my friends. Don't scare me because I said, I just bought this house. I just moved in. I really don't want to have to leave. So I said, I dig it that you're here taking care of me, and I'm really happy about that. But please don't scare me or my friends anymore and quit stealing our ki- kitchen utensils. <laughs> and he never showed up again. He was cool after that. There but it's funny because I've, a- I've asked Andre when I bought my other, ha- when I bought my ranch, I said, hey, Andre, is Ramon here too? And he goes, yep. And I went, get out. He goes, oh, yeah, no, he's going to be with you for the rest of your life. I went, okay. <laughs> and now I'm in a different house. And I asked him again if he's here because he came back from Paris and they were visiting. And he goes, oh, yeah, he's here. I went, okay. So that's my paranormal. Thing. Hey, that's why I asked the question. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> What's the best advice you've received in your career and who gave it to you? <laughs> <laughs> well, Fred Phillips told me something once that I absolutely cannot repeat. Um, but that was really funny the day he told me that. Um, but I think probably the best advice I ever got was like, just be true to yourself and don't worry about anybody else. You know, don't worry about somebody taking a job from you or whatever. If you're supposed to be at that job, you'll have it. It's just like, because these days, all these kids are afraid that somebody's going to steal my job if they're better than me. You know what? Nobody steals a job from anybody. They the, the actors are fickle. If they want somebody else, because maybe you just don't jive that well with them, you don't need to be with them. You'll get another damn job. And if they want to have somebody else with them, whatever, dudes, let it go. You know, just be true to yourself. Do the best that you can do. And you will always work. Because if you, if you never say anything bad about anybody else or never do anything to screw up anybody else, it's kind of that old saying, you know, do unto others. You right. know? Right. If you only put out good, you're only going to get good back. It's kind of my way of life, I think, in general. It kind of spans ev- everything, you know? Yeah, well said. Well, uh, V, just to put a bow on everything here, uh, is there anything on the horizon for you that you can share yeah, without getting like in trouble? I like the way you talk. <laughs> <laughs> I think the school's enough. <laughs> That's my bow right now. There and you I go. have a huge class next week. We had to like build out the room. It's like, oh my God, I can't even imagine how loud it's going to be in this room. <laughs> <laughs> it was loud last week and there was only like 14 of us. And now next week we have twice as many people. It's going to be low loud in there. I think I'm going to have to have a conversation ahead of time. Like everybody inside voices only. Because <laughs> there's something about men when they get together and they start talking to each other, they get louder and louder <laughs> And louder until I am like in the front of the class going, <laughs> I need to talk. <laughs> so, yeah, that's my bow. There we go. It's a big ass bow, too, and I'm very happy about it. <laughs> well, I wish you nothing but the best with it. And uh, 
Hope the classes go well. And I want to thank you again for giving me some of your time, V. Thank you. You're adorable. You have a great voice. And I wish you all the best, darling. Thank you, V. Uh, have a good rest of your day. Thank you very much. Bye, darling. All right. Bye-bye. All right, folks. That's a wrap. I hope you enjoyed that chat with V. As always, thanks for listening. And we'll see you back next time. Monsters, Madness, and Magic. <laughs> Welcome to the night. You think you know Night Demon? Then the Night Demon Heavy Metal Podcast is for you. Step into the darkness as we peel back the curtain to give you an unprecedented, all access look into the mind and the heart of the demon. We're talking band history, song analysis, studio anecdotes, stories from the road. It's everything a diehard Night Demon fan could want and more. This is the only place to learn the inside scoop, the deep dive trivia, the untold tales from the band members themselves and those closest to the Night Demon story. Need more? The sacred Night Demon crypt will be pried open to reveal demo recordings that have never before seen the light of day. All with in-depth commentary by the band and the people who were there for the writing and recording process. This is a gold mine, a treasure trove of all things Night Demon. Head over to nightdemon.net or wherever you listen to podcasts. Listen to podcasts. Listen to podcasts.